next, I wanted to set the famous psychologist some practical philosophical poses. I want to end this part of the, of the interview just with you, Joel, before we bring your daughter in. Um, my team were curious whether you would be able, actually physically able, to answer questions with just one word answers. Because you think about things on such a high intellectual plane, you're very articulate, you're very thoughtful about them. So I just want to throw a few questions at you and just see whether you can. I'm not saying you have to, I'm just saying, can you? Some are straightforward, some are a little bit more complex, but what's one piece of music we should all listen to? Hank Williams. Which, which song? Any of them? Lovesick Blues. Well, the supplementary is why? Plaintive Truth. <laughs> Perfect. Can money make you happy? Yes. Not by itself. Right. But having money would make you more happy than, than not having money. Having money and opportunity are very similar. And if you're wise, having more opportunity can be better. How many hours of sleep is optimum for the human mind to work properly? It seems that the, the about eight, by the looks of things. Mm. Is marriage good for you? Uh, compared to the alternative. <laughs> Is owning a pet a good idea? Definitely. Dog or Not cat? Not pugs, though. Dogs or cats? Because I, I find that cats... Not pugs. I've Anything but a pug. I've had two... I love pugs. I've had two cats for... Two cats for about 10 months. My first pet since I was a teenager. And I find them to be utter charlatans. Like, whoever gives the most affection gets, gets them. Whereas my family who have dogs, they're, they're very affectionate to everybody. They're not disloyal like the cats. I, I, I like dogs and cats, but I prefer cats because they bite you now and then when you don't expect it, and I think that's, I think that's hilarious. They're <laughs> kind of like women that way. How, we're talking to you women. How much sex is optimum per week, per month? Mm, well, my experience as a clinician, I'll give you a slightly longer answer to this. Um, my experience as a clinician is that people who are married need to communicate about the, the daily, their daily issues for about 90 minutes a week, and they need to spend at least two... They need to have two dates a week, minimum, mm -hmm. to, to sustain their relationship across time. Now, you know, it varies with the couple, obviously, but that's 90 minutes of business-like communication to set, the, to set everything straight and mm -hmm. to keep you updated with your partner, and then you have to spend... You have to have two dates a week to keep the romance in your life alive. And it's really, really, really important to do that. And you can do that, but you have to work at it. And by dates, are you including sex? So is it twice a week is optimum? Depends on how the date goes, man. You should know that. <laughs> should people go to therapy or can it really screw you up? Depends on the therapist and why they go. It can be very, very helpful. Um, there's no real difference between a therapeutic relationship and a genuine relationship. And so the question really is, are genuine relationships beneficial to people? And the answer to that is, of course. And you might say, well, can you mimic a genuine relationship in a therapy practice? And the answer is yes. It, it's not as good as a marriage. If it's a good marriage, it's maybe not even as good as a great friendship. But if you lack both of those, then a therapeutic alliance can be extraordinarily helpful. Now, if your therapist is incautious and poorly trained and foolish and ideologically addled, um, then it can be a complete bloody nightmare. But everything's like that, right? If you go to a surgeon who doesn't know what he's doing, well, yeah. you know, he'll cut off the wrong leg, and that's often not a good thing. <laughs> who is the one philosopher we should all read? Nietzsche. What, breakfast, lunch, or dinner? What's the most important meal of the day? Breakfast. And Admiral McRaven, I don't know if you ever saw this speech, gave a fantastic speech with one of the top uh, military guys in the American military. And it was basically centred around making your bed, that the very first thing you should do mm. each day is mm -hmm. make your bed, because it set a discipline for your day and a purpose and got you going. What would your, yeah. what would your advice be for the first thing people should do when they get up? Mm. Open their eyes. And look around them. It's a good thing to do all day is open your damn eyes and what see is... what's right in front of you well the bed the bed making bed making duplicates the cosmic order by the way mm. right because you make order out of chaos and that's a good thing to do when you first awaken because you're reenacting the 
the creation of the world in a symbolic manner. And finally, on this part of the... No, it's a good day, way to get your day going. <laughs> yeah, it is. The f final part of this uh, section. What is the best and the worst thing about being Jordan Peterson? The worst? I'm a bit much, you might say. I'm sort of running in, I'm running in all directions very rapidly, and so that can be um, a bit much. It's hard on people around me. I'm a bit much, man. And what's the best thing about you? The best thing about being me? Yeah. It's overwhelming, really. Well, the deep appreciation that people have for what I've been doing. Mm. It's stunning. It's, it's soul-destroying, but it's amazing. Is it not soul-enhancing? I mean, I feel it when I do interviews with you, the reaction I get from people, just how much you mean to them. I, I mean, I can imagine it. Soul yeah, well, that's a bit much, you know. I mean, look, when I go, wherever I go, it's so strange, eh, because wherever I go, it's like I have friends there because I walk down the street and people wave at me and, you know, they call up my name. and It's a bit much. It's amazing. It's really something, but... It's amazing. But it's hard it? to... It's, it is. It's hard to... It's hard to wrap my head around it. It's very hard to wrap my head around it. And especially because it happened to me, you know, when I was, well, I didn't, when I was older than 50, it's, it's been quite an adjustment. I wouldn't say it's one I've made. And it's an, it's an immense responsibility. And I'm not complaining about that at all. I'd be a fool to complain, an ungrateful fool. But it's, um, you know, it's a strange thing to have far more than you could ever imagine. What do you mean? Well, that's my life. I have far more than I could ever imagine. Mm. I didn't think it was possible. I mean, you've become somebody who, in the later stage of a life... Now you did it again. You got me again, God well, damn it's, it. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, you are, you are an emotional person, I know that. Um, but I think it's also interesting to me what makes you emotional. And it, in a way, it's similar to why you were emotional last time I talked to you, is that you are very acutely aware of the influence you now have over so many millions of people. And I think you feel that responsibility profoundly. And I think that's what triggers in you an emotion. It's, it's, yeah, it's gratitude. Yeah. It's an you amazing... know, imagine someone gave you everything you could possibly imagine. Yeah. And more. Well, that's the situation I'm in. And do you find it, do you find it overwhelming sometimes? Always. Mm. Always. Yeah. I think that's partly what made me ill. Yeah. It's an amazing thing, Jordan. I, want to, I can't think of a better segue, actually, than to bring in, for the next part of this interview, your daughter, Michaela, who will have been, I'm sure, watching this and knows you better than anybody. So we're going to come back and have the second part, which is two Petersons for the price of one. Terrible thing to inflict on the world. 